Um, and we use the platform of sport to really drive change. And we're continually being asked to help organizations. Some of them at the beginning of the journey, some of them more advanced, and some of them we've been working with for a number of years. But we're being challenged by the leaders and increasingly driven because of what fans are asking, what the sponsors are asking now, their commercial partners, to create these really ambitious but achievable strategies. And my feeling is we're now really at a tipping point where sports got to a stage where just getting our house in order isn't enough anymore. And we've got a real role to play in these global social and environmental challenges that we're all facing. And we really have an opportunity to deliver and create inspiring, real measurable change that really changes uh, the world for good. So super good to have the three of you, Carol, Fukund and Jürgen, to take this discussion forward mm -hmm. and explore the question, you know, sport and sustainability and, and what would it take for the football industry to to lead the way. So my first question, and please add any more to the intro that is, you know, a bit of background about yourselves as well. But, you know, my first question, and, and I love this quote from Nelson Mandela about sport is the power to change the world. And, and more recently, you know, Andrew Parsons, president of the International Paralympic Committee said, the future of sport is at that intersection of purpose and entertainment. And my feeling, or my question to you, and, and we can start, let's start with Jürgen. Uh, what does the power of sport and of football mean to you? And, and what do you see as the future trends or, or challenges that sport's facing? Hey everyone, a pleasure to be here and, and share um, this conversation with, with everyone um, on the panel and in the audience. Um, <laughs> I do think that actually we, we should think about a new quote. <laughs> and this quote is now quite getting in, in its ages. And I, I do think that um, it's while it's still valid, um, I do think that um, there can be a, a more like um, contemporary um, expression of, of what it is. And I do think that it actually what I do think about sport and football especially is that it's very much about not just doing something and playing that role but actually being something like being a better version of itself and in this direction i would i would want to change that quote like um i don't know what it is and 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 who who, who might have said it <laughs> but but, but, I do, <laughs> but, I, but i do think it's more about being than doing um and and maybe this is where where sports especially team sports have a very authentic role to play because that's what they are and and if we are true to ourselves like any change at the scale of the challenges um will need radical team play and and who else um than sport has an authentic um like an experience on that and how can and, and and the way to translate that into action um of people because it's probably the only thing that really speaks to people's hearts um and people's emotions and people's passion um and and that's totally unearthed so football and sport is like beyond sporadical um, or sporadic, um, it's not really using that access um, and using in a good way, like in, 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 in a way of shifting people's minds um, to a place where, where we start understanding contribution as a currency of success um, versus accumulation as an example. Um, and we could, we could draw more, more examples on it. So I do think that um, football and sport hasn't woken up to its potential. It's still about like, how can we use sport and how can we create more access for people to sport and how can we send the right messages? I think it's much more than that. It's um, and, and that's totally unearthed. And in my opinion, within the system, there is no, like, like no, I'm, I'm obviously generalizing here, but there's no, true vision for the sport no true vision for football um and no leadership really on on the level of of where it could really make a difference um, um but football is is rather being managed than led um on 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 most in most parts 
Yeah, and I, I like your um, I, I like your thing about being something rather than just doing. And and I got stopped once, and or I was chatting to someone, and they said, "Now's the time, isn't it, to move from intention to action?" And I think that's that's also where sport is being held to account. So, um, Carol, maybe you want to to have a go at that as well. Like, what's the power of sport to you? Obviously, come from a different background. You've got you know yeah. football Wales behind you, and um, yeah, how, what does that mean for you? And, and those future sort of trends and challenges, where do you see? Thank you. Um, well, as you can imagine, my, my background um, before I um, embarked on a plural career was in, um, in the city of London, using a lot of data to try and make predictions. So I have to tell you that about myself, but that I'm a very data driven person. And I'm not swayed by the, the last thing I heard at a football match. Um, I really want to understand what people are, um, who, who are, you know, the, the wider football family inside Wales in the first instance, but, but globally really are thinking about things. Um, and last year I was given the chance by the Football Association of Wales and um, to, to lead um, a, a group looking into what would it take to create the Sustainable Football Association for the future. And uh, Kelly Davis, who's on the call today, was with me uh, on that journey. I was chairing the steering group, which met, uh, I think we met nine times once a month and gathered in data on all sorts of aspects of, of the game. So when we came to make 80, 80 recommendations to the Council of the Football Association of Wales, which is uh, made up of uh, mostly elderly white men, um, we were able to get those recommendations through because they were they were genuinely data driven and it wasn't something that one of us had heard at a football match um, and was rel relating anecdotes. And some of the changes that we wanted to make were really very fundamental and uh, included governance as well as um, creating financial sustainability. So. What I said when I introduced that to the, to, the, to the council meeting was, you know, the world is changing, Wales is changing, and we must be at least with that change, but hopefully one or two steps ahead of it. And we've set ourselves the ambition to become an exemplar as a small nation playing football around the world to share very widely the, um, the experiences that the we have in Wales of putting, putting a principle in, into action. And to, part of that, we, we, we've created a coalition, a Welsh football coalition, which um, initially in its first meeting back in March included politicians of all genres, um, ones, ones from Westminster, ones from, um, ones from uh, Cardiff and also lo local government. It, it included sports funding agencies, and it included, of course, our, our, our wider football family. But now that we've qualified for the World Cup, we've got a bigger challenge because um, at, that origin, at that first meeting of the Welsh Football Coalition, um, Ian Rush was one of our speakers, who is a great uh, supporter of Welsh football. And um, I saw that he said in the press, I think in the last week, that he's really looking forward to now not being more famous than his country, that Wales will be there on, on the world stage. So now we very much have to look out and we're going to speak about um, the implementation of some of those um, 80 recommendations that, that Kelly and I worked on um, to the wider football community uh, at our next meeting and involve still more um, more stakeholders and what I would say to you is the power of uh, football can be measured in numbers sure it can and we've published what it's worth to the Welsh economy and it's more than 550 million pounds a year but that's not the point um, since we qualified for the World Cup of course we've had the politicians all over us but we've had the poets all over us as well so it's the whole run of society that wants to uh, be part of, of this journey and uh, I hope that sustainability will be, and I, I know it will be, 
a key part of what we what we achieve by going to Qatar. So I'll stop there and I can come back on a number of those points um, if you like. Yeah, and I think that I I think that's really interesting that how you can use it to become you know to become not just to become famous but it will you know it will give you and you're creating that that platform to to make a stance and I think hopefully that you know smaller nations you know like Wales can can really help drive actually and and uh, do some dynamic things and drive those you know those bigger nations who may be more sort of traditional or stuck in their ways. So. Okay, if I um, can come on, could I come back on one, one thing? Yeah. Um, you know, your your original quote was talking about um, at the inter intersection of purpose and entertainment. I, I really do believe it's at the at the intersection of well being and health and and entertainment as well. And that aspect of things in the you know very difficult aftermath of of COVID and so on is not to be underestimated. Sure, it's um, it's good for us to play play football. Um, and Jürgen talked about um, working in teams and that sort of thing. This is the mentality that we all have to have now. And this will help give resilience to our young people and enable some of the quite tough yards that need to be made on decarbonisation and all those other things to get done. Yeah, no, totally. And I think that's the role, isn't it, of, of athletes. And yeah. which brings me nicely onto you, Fakunda, as, a, as our uh, athlete on the panel. Um, not saying that uh, the rest of you aren't, but uh, obviously that's what you're here for as well. But Fakunda, can you give us a bit of your background, or not just background, but you know the power of sport? You've obviously had a whole heap of different experiences to us sitting here, and, and those sort of future trends that you can see. Yes, absolutely. Actually, um, this quote is one of my favorite quotes that I grew up um, kind of listening to. And I do agree. I think sport truly does have the power to change the world. And through the use of sport, we can bring positive social change in our communities, whether that be locally or globally. And especially sport can be used for social development. So whether that be including or empowering women and girls, um, refugees and newcomers, underprivileged communities, and really focusing in on the education and the peace building side of sport and building critical life skills throughout the process. Um, because sport is a universal language and it's something that we, our hearts touch um, in a way that doesn't really connect with other things, I would say uh, through being involved in sport, people feel included in society and we need to rather than continue these discussions, like Jurgen said, it's about implementing it and taking action after the discussions. So in football particularly, we see discussions combating racism, uh, discrimination, uh, most recently expressing views against war. These are all great starting points, but um, how can we do it? How can we initiate action and ensure that it's sustainable? And I really believe that this can be done as a team effort. And similar to what Carol said, it's not about who begins the initiative, whether it be a small nation or a large nation, it's about inspiring change. And together we can ensure that we are successful at that. Do you, um, do you think there should be like requirements on you know, the role of sport and tackling these global challenges and things? Do you think we should actually put some requirements on sort of minimum levels or do you think that would come from, uh, from that sort of groundswell of, of movement? I do believe there should be some sort of requirements. I say this because footballers and football clubs are role models within society, especially for uh, young avid fans. And so when these young fans from a young age learn about uh, whether that be playing for the oceans or reducing plastic waste or having unique themes per week, uh, promoting gender equality or reducing poverty, um, these all in the long term, I think impact shift mindsets and when mindsets are shifted within a society, then everyone feels a sense of entitlement to, um, I guess, to progress uh, the social development of the world and progress social issues and make it everyone's business. So yes, I do think uh, football clubs should be held accountable. accountable, footballers should be held accountable. And with that, hopefully that will transcend uh, to everyone involved in sport. And that, and that's uh, obviously easier 
<laughs> easier said than done sometimes actually the implementation piece of that isn't it but I mean moving on and, and maybe coming back to you Carol what do you what do you see as the sort of biggest barriers but so you know we we've all recognized football and sport has a role to play in in addressing some of the you know our future challenges whether that's you know racism inclusivity gender the carbon uh, and the climate challenge but what do you think is the biggest barrier for football to to really become this kind of advocate leader that that maybe we'd like to see i mean i think you're from what you're saying is that you're actually you're you know you're leading the way you want to you want to drive it have you come across any sort of barriers in there or what do you see as your biggest challenge to get there well you're looking at one of the barriers um, which is i'm the first woman to serve on the board of um, the football association of wales which is the third oldest football association in the world you know um there need to be many more of me around the place but then there needs to be much better diversity across the piece and that's going to take time. Uh, the phrase Turkey's voting for Christmas has been used um, and it's been not just used in football, it's been used in rugby, it's been used in many, many sports, that the, the people who've given um, decades of their lives towards volunteering um, to serve on governing bodies, it's not a small thing that they've done. Um, but I would, I would argue the world in which we live now and the challenges that we're facing and the degree of change that we're facing it means that you absolutely need to harness the diversity in your in your country um, and indeed the world in order to tackle these these problems. And one of the biggest problems of all, I found, and I, I, I serve on a number of boards, including uh, the Development Bank of Wales and a number of uh, public companies. The biggest problem is getting the young voice through to uh, the people who are making the, making the decision. So we have to find ways of doing this. And um, one, of, one of the great things that we've got in Wales is um, an act of, um, an act of, of government, um, which is called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which was passed in 2015 and came into law the following year. And what this does is a huge help to us because forces you to think long term. It forces you not to uh, not to make short term decisions, even if that's the easy thing to do. So think through the consequences and have the long term resource plan in, in place. And um, we 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 in, in football since um, since I joined the board and I mentioned this act for the first time in that boardroom, it's become a real central thing for us we do talk about it a lot we think about it when we're making our investment decisions and we're aligning ourselves with the trajectory that 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 is moving across of course it itself is informed by the sustainable development goals so um it hasn't come out of thin thin air um but it, you know that sort of thing is a tremendous help i think yeah. No, I agree. And I'm, <clears throat> and I, you know, the work I've done and, and when you're challenging, whether it's the international federations or wherever it is, or <clears throat> I look at my, my kids participating in sport and, and their role models. And, and actually back to you, Fakunda, as someone who's take, you know, been a player, uh, who were your coaches and who were the kind of officials? I mean, my feeling is that the, you know, for my, I have two girls and the, the, people who are blowing the whistles generally are, are men and that becomes the role model and actually it's throughout not just the playing and we're seeing a step change in football aren't we with you know the rise of women's sport in football in you know in rugby and cricket and thing it's is phenomenal and it's great oh Susie you've gone on mute in adversity oh sorry <laughs> um <laughs> we you know we really need to uh we need to embrace that, but we need to embrace that across the whole of the sport, not just the players. And I think from, you know, yes. seeing you as that first uh, first board member, trickling it down across through out coaching and, and the whole thing will become that that role model. I mean, Fakun, did you want to, to um, add something to that? Uh, I would love to actually echo that because similar to what you just said, um, in order to for football to progress, we need to diversify uh, the executive ranks for sure, because growing up myself and even currently playing professional football, um, I don't see many people like myself, uh, whether it be coaching staff, 
fellow players. And if you don't see yourself reflected within the football industry, odds are that, you know, A, we're not going to diversify the sport. We're not going to have greater or more unique ideas that will progress the sport in an enriching way. And uh, second of all, we are going to you know, never progress things like gender equality. We're never going to look at greater social issues. And that is concerning for me with regards to some barriers that we may experience. Another barrier that I, I strongly believe is um, campaigns without education. So we see a lot of this say no to racism campaign or, you know, other campaigns that FIFA or uh, the EPL come out with. And although they're great, it's a great starting point. Um, with a campaign without um, education behind fans, without coaching staff being educated on it, and staff is just um, empty or meaningless. And so what we have to do is have develop workshops, um, uh, really allow people to understand what it is behind discrimination and racism. And what we do often is the other way around. So uh, recently I saw an interview of a uh, uh, a black footballer that was experiencing racism and uh, what they were doing was asking him how racism could be solved but that's essentially telling uh, you know the victim to solve global issues whereas it's not his issue that he's experiencing racism it's society's issue for being racist towards him so why is the the load on him to come up with a solution uh, of a problem that isn't his uh, so I think it's more like the conversation needs to be the other way around. Those that are in the wrong need to address it and understand what it is in order to actually um, come up with uh, meaningful solutions. Yeah. And I mean, Jürgen, on, on that one and on, on uh, that sort of, those sort of grassroots programs, uh, you know, what's your experience in there and have you um, used your programs and your your work with Common Goal to really try and address some of those gender imbalances and, and those inclusion issues? Yeah, maybe maybe just a word on, on Common Goal so that we all have the same understanding of, of what it is. Um, like the, 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 the idea or the, the driving um, vision behind Common Goal is to repurpose football for good. And, and that to do that the mission behind is to actually maximize football's contribution to people and planet and the way we do it is we want to enable every stakeholder to play their part so we are an enabling uh, supporting organization um and just on on some of the topics that have been raised like anti-racism or or lgbtq um plus so there is um, obviously there is this these far away global goals that's hard to understand the technicalities of it, um, the indicators of it, and how to translate it into my concrete action. So what we try to do is to really make that very tangible and translate it into collective efforts um, that would speak to that specific global goal, but at the same time would also be something people can really engage in. So there's like play proud, for example, is a is a very specific educational element that can be offered to clubs, to athletes, to coaches, etc. The same with the anti-racist program, um, from executives to whoever like stakeholder who who wants to be part of the solution in regards to that specific challenge, um, will find a response to that. But that's just like on 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 how we go about like. Um, translating the SDGs or the global goals into something that would become relevant to an industry like football or something to engage like in a in a day to day um, on a day to day basis and really embedded in 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 the operational functioning of it but if I may I would want to go back to your original question which was like what's the biggest barriers um and there's, there, there's many of them. Um, Carol already alluded to one. Um, and actually that's, if we talk about, um, earlier we mentioned that um, football could, could do campaigning, but I, I ask myself, and I'm, I'm sure my, my 25 year old daughters ask themselves the same question. Like, what do I think about an organization where Carol is the first female um, 
board member or um, a football institution, call it FIFA or UEFA or, or whatever else confederation, um, having a campaign on gender equity. Like how, how does that work? Um, it just doesn't. People don't believe anymore. People see behind. Um, and, and, and it's, it's just, um, you, you need to be like, you you need you need need to be what you're preaching about, and you can't just um, like use the platform of football to tell everybody else to do the right thing, but you have to do it yourself too. So so I think the authenticity question is a is a big one, and I and I think football and and that's probably the biggest challenge is the the entrenched nature of football, like this bubble thing. Football works within right, and and I do think that this unbreakable fan loyalty in the past has been a double a double sided sword in, in in that in that respect like on the one side um it's obviously great um and it offers football to be this platform we're currently talking about that should be really unlocked in terms of having people at scale um shift their minds towards the the right um, attitude but on the other side it has also allowed football to live in this bubble um without a really performing um as, as you would expect from a business um and making a lot of administrative and business um wise wrong decisions um fans would just continue to follow and growth would still be two digit um no other industry would could 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 treat their customers like that if you want um um because the loyalty is just not as much as it is in football or it has been in football it might actually be changing which is something football should be worried about and it changes with a speed that football is far too slow to actually follow it um look at the the, the hundred years of history and of the world football federation and carol being first as an example again um so it's just we don't have decades in order to change football because then like that it's it's it, it probably football won't exist anymore as we know it today because it's just falling behind and there will be another football reality that will take its place because this is where people want to be. People want to be respected. They want to be talked to on an eye level. They want to identify themselves with something. They want to belong to something. Um, and it's not just the, the fans, it's also the athletes. I remember, I remember um, once I went with Juan Mata, who has been the co-founder of Common Goal, um, to to a meeting at UEFA, and we we entered this lobby, um, and there's all the the trophies around the lobby, and 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 Juan, as he was walking like through this lobby and looking at all these trophies, he ended um, by saying, um, "I have won all of those, um, like in my career." But at the same time, he has never been at UEFA or dealt with anybody at UEFA before, so the institutions are so far away from fans from athletes actually who they're supposed <clears throat> to serve in the first place um because um the treasure of football has been mandated to them in order to really treasure it and make the best version of it um yeah. and not use it in 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 in, in order to mm -hmm. to just personally benefit from it and do you think on two bits there i want to go back to the the bit about this unbreakable fan loyalty because my feeling is that with this with this change and the rise of like female football and the changing nature of it and the fact that people are now much more critical and much more vocal and there is a platform isn't it? social media is given a platform to be vocal but do you think the the core existing fans maybe it is unbreakable because football is strange like that isn't it it has this kind of unbreakable fan piece but actually yeah, I, I, opportunity I, I think, the opportunity I, with the with all of those fans who actually haven't really been engaged because they couldn't see people like them, 50% of the population playing football, actually that opportunity starts outweighing the commercial maybe opportunity of that existing core fan. So you do get this rapid shift and you do get, um, <clears throat> you do get this change. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe the, the, the technology, like the, the whole, Web three related technology where we are currently experiencing. Maybe you can see it very bluntly in that um, you can see football. I'm generalizing. Please ex excuse me for that. Um, but in general, football is jumping at it with the same Web two logic, like or with the same old logic in terms of 
oh, a new income rev uh, strategy, a new income generation opportunity, and how it, can we get now through this more money from the fans or or whatever, and and instead of looking at oh oh here's an opportunity for equity, here's an opportunity for participation, here's an opportunity for um, for transparency. So the, here here's a whole bunch of opportunities that I think. Um, is, is is again not seen and it it just tends to to accelerate this journey of 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 staying behind um what what's really happening in the world and 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 the gap between what football could be doing or what football could could become in order to to act differently like vis-a-vis -a, -vis a global a global humanity and thus play this unique enabling role which nothing else can play we we don't have any more like a unifying religion we don't have any more un unifying politics we're we are divided every time more we have more autocracies than democracies like a kind of thing uh, uh, football is this one thing that has the capacity and therefore i'm so frustrated um that changes happen so slowly or actually go backwards like when when the Super League thing happened, I actually, during the pandemic, thought, okay, this is an opportunity for football. W once and for all, for the first time in history, there's actually fear that it might break, that there might not be enough resources to really maintain it and further develop it and blah. So there might be a, an opportunity to rethink. But when the Super League then came up and, and it was, there was a, a victory over, over the Super League, then the old thing was was again good enough like it, it was not as bad as it was before because it there was something worse coming um like sort of and mentality then um I'm, I'm not a psychologist but 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 what i felt is then people felt into a comfort zone again um as long as we can maintain this this is this is good enough and i and i think the opportunity again like that was obviously um it's it's hard to tell covid an opportunity but 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 I do think that crisis bring also opportunities for change and and I think that one was missed again. Yeah, and I and I think I mean you know to your point of um, you know where the money's coming from and the fans and all that kind of stuff. Just to, on uh, my feeling is, you know, we're largely driven or we are driven a lot by by corporates. Uh, and I guess a, a question and I and I might bring you in here, Carol, who's come from a sort of banking oil and gas sector. Like you know, those are major sports sponsors. Um, should we be looking at the future about the types of sponsors? Is every sponsor a good sponsor? Is all money in the sport a good money? Or should we mm -hmm. be really looking at, and, and it's going to be a brave sport, isn't it? Who's going to turn down some of this, you know, there's a, there's a money coming from all different areas and, and maybe doesn't all align with sustainability goals. So, no. yeah, well, how, I, how do I you see that? That's a that's a very very good good question. I, I, I just go back on one thing that Jürgen mentioned there, which was the Super League. I'm a bit of a half full person, so I took that really positively. Even though it was my old bank at the middle of it, I was appalled. But anyway, that they think they thought that they could get that one away, um, they were completely wrong. But the lesson for me in all of that is they didn't talk to the fans, right? They didn't consider the stakeholders. They just saw the number of zeros at the end of the um, at the end of the rainbow and I found that deeply encouraging actually that um, you know they had to you know roll back on that very substantially but I think the sensible clubs and the sensible football associations will be taking from that that you must know your supporter base you must know the stakeholders involved in in your business and uh, it is a business, unfortunately. It's a very large business, and you must have responsibility towards them. So, um, you know, go going go going back to sponsorship, yes, you must be really, really careful with that. And it's quite easy for even institutions like universities and museums to fall into traps there. People who purport to be, um, you know, intellectual thought leaders on all sorts of things. Um, but I think the key thing um, in all of this is to create something sustainable that's not wasteful, that um, can thrive in, in, in a different business model and not 
have to look for, you know, the massive sponsorship deal or um, one or two big high profile corporate things, but to weave in um, support at, at all sorts of levels and to get stakeholders um, across countries and indeed across um, the, the governing bodies of the sport as well, UEFA and FIFA, to support what's going on and to drive change. And I have to say, so far, and it's, this is only based on two and a half years experience, but so far, my experience of dealing with UEFA and FIFA, um, or admittedly at a relatively low level, um, on sustainability has been positive. They're saying the right things. And if they're saying the right things to um, enough countries around the world, enough clubs around the world, then, then, then we're in with a chance. It's not job done by any means, um, but maybe by us in little Wales demonstrating that we mean what we say when, when we say these things, uh, maybe there's a chance to showcase, you know, how do you embed this stuff in your strategy? Because when I joined, uh, sustainability was going to be a pillar among six pillars holding up like a classical temple, right? I said, no, five pillars, and that's a foundation, actually. Sustainability is the foundation. You cannot, you know, you cannot have it just sitting out there on the right-hand side, ticking boxes. It's got to be fundamental and feeding through like a stick of rock. You know, I'm showing my age now, the seaside rock, where, where the name comes, comes <laughs> I right I know exactly through. what you're talking about, don't worry about that. <laughs> um, I think it, you mentioned about um, the different business model, and I think this is something that's quite interesting, isn't it? Could we be looking at model, business models that align to like the global goals, for example, or align to these climate targets? So a business model, instead of it being a lot of money for a short term, maybe one or two years, actually is, we're going to work together until 2030 where we've got these net zero targets. And actually we start seeing a, a much longer term commitment because sustainability is largely about longer term commitments. Could we yeah. have targets that are around that health and well-being piece that are actually well, much longer? I'm afraid it's government. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm afraid to say that is government. And, and um, I mentioned, you know, real money by um, children leading healthier lives um, by, individuals being up, uplifted by their association with sport through volunteering or whatever. Um, you know, that's a big, big number. Um, and we calculated based on um, the UEFA methodology, uh, working out social return on investment, that um, out of the 550 million or so that the Wales um, brings into the economy, um, more than 200 of that is potentially a saving on healthcare. So cutting childhood obesity, um, having more resilient, um, sort of less, you know, emotionally stressed people, um, people with purpose, volunteering, that's, that's a big, big aspect of this, this sort of stuff. It's, it's not about numbers really, but it's about participation in a very wide, wide sense and feeling part of something and that's where your health system starts feeling very real benefits pretty quickly yeah yeah and Fakunda, i mean you you've been using it to to you know help refugees settle in and be part of be part yeah. of that how's how's that gone well that's been absolutely marvelous and um i'm, I'm proud to say that um the most uh, the, the first recent group of um Refugees were Afghans, and uh, 120 were housed in in Cardiff in um, accommodation which belongs to um, a youth association in Wales called the Earth, and uh, they were still housed in that accommodation when Wales playing one of its um, one of its um, games last autumn, and we were able to bring them all to the match, and so we said to the Earth, right here here are the free tickets. And by the way, we'll send some buses as well to make sure that they get there. It was, it was close enough to walk as it happens, but but nevertheless, you know, and it was heartrending to see um, Afghan children who literally had fled with their families um, cheering the Welsh team along. So that was brilliant. And now we've got um, 
um, in, in, in the West Wales branch of this um, youth association, the Earth, um, we have Ukrainian families. And no doubt um, we will be doing something more in the Football Association of Wales for Ukraine. We've already obviously uh, collected money and supported them at our matches. Yeah. But we will be doing more. And it was um, perhaps our misfortune that it was they we had to beat in order to qualify for the World Cup. Yeah. But you can't win them all. But um, so anyway, yeah. we, um, we feel a lot of solidarity with them. So and Wales wants to be a nation of sanctuary. And I, I absolutely argue that they are. The attitude of the Welsh government is very different to yeah. what it is. Um, I'm talking to you from London, even even compared with here. Yeah. And Fakunda, do you want to just pick that up? I realise we've got some uh, questions in here. I think we've answered some of them. Um, I'm just going to have a, a quick look through. But Fakunda, you've definitely used uh, to, you know, with refugees and, and using that power of sport. Absolutely. Sport, again, is just a, an incredible tool for social development. And what we were doing even prior to the crisis, the Ukrainian and the Afghan crisis most recently was um, a couple of years ago, I started a, a nonprofit organization in Toronto, Canada, uh, which is known as Scarborough Simbas. Now, Scarborough is an area where most refugees and newcomers reside in Toronto. And what we do is we use sport to help ease their settlement journey and really build critical life skills throughout the process uh, with regards to, um, you know, building courage, building self-esteem, uh, making them feel like an included part of society. And uh, it's been, it's a free program. It's been doing very well. And we've really fostered a sense of community and a sense of um, identity for the kids, which is incredible. But also most recently um, have been, supporting heavily with regards to the resettlement of the Afghan youth national players in Portugal that I helped lead the evacuation of. And again, sport is just so empowering and it's so important with regards to integration as well because um, the young girls are now part of their local municipality club teams. Uh, they are spread out throughout Portugal, but all of them are competing with Portuguese nationals. And it's just been uh, a very seamless way to interact, to connect, to learn about the culture, learn the language. Um, and it's really, um, you know, increase their self-esteem and self-worth throughout the process. But I do want to go back to a point that you uh, briefly mentioned about uh, sport bodies and should we uh, limit where we play based on a, based off of human rights and um, uh, should we sanction and you know eliminate some of the options. Um, I would say yes, of course, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, I don't know which one you would go for, but sport is extremely political. And as a result, um, we have double standards that exist. So uh, although as nations, as football governing bodies and organizations, we do need to hold each other accountable with regards to human rights abuses, where, where we have a business, um, so sport and football as a business um, do have a lot of double standards. So for instance, if a footballer is to uh, stand up and voice their concerns against human rights abuses or human rights violations, um, unfortunately, if um, their club team is sponsored by, uh, let's say for instance, in the case of Mesut Ozil, standing up for uh, Uyghur rights or standing up against uh, the violations within China. But of course there's negative repercussions because as a football club, Arsenal is heavily um, invested or, or has a lot of revenue coming in from certain nations. So it's really difficult and tricky. And that's where we have to find that balancing point where do footballers, do athletes have a platform that they can actually voice their concerns? Um, can we truly work towards um, addressing human rights issues so or one of the and one of the questions and just to pick up on this is like could could labels like B Corps type label could it be used to help sports federations you know uh, um, the major events and things if we use something like that and and to your point Carol data behind it 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 then becomes a sign you know the, the then the science behind the ranking a certain place may have or an event for choosing whether that's the corporates or the or the place that it goes do you think that's um a way to to address some of these challenges 
Sorry, you're, yeah, was that for me? Oh, I've, no, it was kind of back to Facunda, really. To, yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's a tricky one. I don't even know how we would address those sort of questions because as football as a business, um, you know, when you have so much revenue coming in and when you don't have the consumers or customers uh, constantly asking questions about the details with regards to how funds are managed, where they're coming in from. Um, and then all of a sudden, one of your footballers stands up against human rights violations. Um, you feel like as a consumer or customer, hey, you're going to ruin our business now. Um, so it's very complex. I would love to learn uh, from the other panelists what their approach would be. I think every example is unique almost, you know, and, and you have to, um, again, this comes back to uh, you need a quality board. You need diverse perspectives on that board so that you consider as many of, of um consider the question in the round. Let's okay. put it that way. Carol, on uh, one of the questions here is um, if sustainability and principles are the bedrock of the Welsh FA strategy, has there been any thought about not taking part in Qatar? Um, no, but there's very serious thought going, going on about, um, you know, the country that we're visiting and what the, uh, what the concerns are. And um, this is um, a good example of diversity. Um, I may not be much of a footballer, but I first went to Qatar in 1995 when the massive uh, um, liquefied natural gas harbour was being built on which their whole prosperity is, is, is built, basically. That's what's paying for this World Cup. So I know Doha when it was a whitewashed village with a couple of minarets, right? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> bringing that cultural appreciation of, of, of the country, but also um, having kept a, you know, a watching brief on it through, through time, that would be something that I will be taking into the boardroom as yeah. we prepare to be in Qatar. Uh, it's a done deal, it is in Qatar. That's what um, a previous regime in FIFA decided. Um, but now we must make sure that our ethics um, are not compromised uh, while we're there. So I'm gonna, we're going to uh, start sort of wrapping up the conversation and a few more bits from the questions around, um, you know, uh, what are the most immediate changes uh, um, that an organization could in, in implement and what's stopping them in that? And um, looking at, there's another one in here, uh, what does the industry, does it have the capabilities to shift those mindsets? Um, what upskilling is needed to get that change at scale? And with all that in mind, my sort of final question to you is if you had to select one thing that you would need to address, tackle that big challenge that you need to get out of the way um, for football to really lead the way, my question to you guys is what would, what would that be? What do you really want to see if there was one thing which said, right, you've got an opportunity to change football, whatever it is, what would that be? Who wants to go first? Yeah, I can, I, I can do that. Um, I would want football to commit to its own potential and to define bold but achievable goals on the people and the planet side by 2030 and use the 2030 World Cup actually starting with a bidding process um, to, to guarantee that it's not just another football event, but it's actually the celebration of football's contribution to people and planet. If, if I go next, I'll build directly on what you just said, Jürgen. Um, uh, the UK home nations and Ireland decided not to bid for the 2030 World Cup. But when we were contemplating it, that was absolutely what, uh, what we were hoping to focus on. So hopefully that'll go into the 2028 Euros instead, mm -hmm. which we are still um, involved in. Um, but... I don't think I need to say any more than um, diversity brings the skills that you need to, to effect the radical change that's needed. And we haven't got all day here. We haven't got, uh, you know, we must act. And we haven't talked much about decarbonisation today, but it's absolutely, uh, that part of sustainability really needs to be addressed. and. The exemplar of football could be 
a really good one um, in the context of a World Cup or a European Championships to show what is possible and bake that into things. But having diverse voices around the table is absolutely critical and every football association and every club should be trying to do that as soon as possible. Maybe just one thing in addition to what you just said in terms of, I do think that um, it relates slightly to B Corp as a potential seal that could work also for football. I think the independent part of it is important. So um, like we're looking at financial fair play and one could think, okay, we could have a social or sustainability fair play or an environmental fair play or whatever. But I do think that external independent ceiling of a status, I think that is, that is helpful. And, um, and I do think that um, this independent outside of football, there's so many solutions that would put themselves at service of football to become the best version of itself. So I would want football just to listen and to open the eyes of all the people that just want to help um, football to be the best it can. And, yeah. and if that happened, football could be zero carbon emission by 2030. I like that. And Facunde, you can have the last word. Yeah, I think certainly FIFA and UEFA are on the right path. We just need to continue to execute and lead by not just um, lead by action and example for sure. Yeah. So uh, thank you all three of you. Fascinating conversation. We could have gone on for hours. Uh, we're only at the tip of the iceberg, I think, but, uh, you know, love to carry on the conversations another time. But we thank you for bringing us all together and Ashoka for uh, bringing everyone together today. And I hope everyone who's been listening has, uh, you know, has got a lot out of it and, um, you know, feel free to drop people. I know uh, in there are um, LinkedIn and, and connect with us and, and, you know, carry on the conversation. But appreciate everyone's interest and I'll, I'll hand back to Ria for the final words. Thank you, Susie. And thank you for Jürgen and Carolus for this very insightful conversation. I think one of the things to quote back to what Jürgen mentioned, um, I think all of us in this room and beyond know, and we're astute, astutely aware that we don't actually have decades because at the current rate of change, um, football may not be what it is and the world may not be what it is. Um, so thank you to everyone for attending this discussion. We encourage you to get in touch with Ashoka and with our panelists if you're interested in our work and would like to get involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.